if you have questions later on. Okay, so uh, here's an example. And a few years ago, I think in 2019, Mr. Biden had re retired ostensibly from the presidency, and then there was a, a quick election for the, the, the kind of one. And there is a, the expectation that he will win. <laughs> so that expectation may have an impact on on the stock market on case. Well, investors are, are, are very conservative. They, they like political stability. So if Tsukaya wins the election, we might expect case stock prices to rise the next day. If stock markets are not responding quickly to information, but election returns, then stock prices should rise on the day after the election. A business inefficient market hypothesis. But EMH says that people will act not only on what happened yesterday, but also on all the information that they have available, both current and past. To the investors that not after the election, but before it, on the expectation that the time will win. Maybe on, on the day uh, that the, the election, the snap election was announced. So there is the detestable hypothesis we want to know whether stock prices go more rapidly on the day of the announcement On, on the day after the election. So if, if they're acting on the expectation that the time will win, the fact that he does win, 
it's still very new sporting. So there's no impact on the election on the day after he deteriorates the votes. So that might be an interesting paper for somebody. And there was the Sunday of a of, 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 of very speaking interpretation of the efficient market hypothesis. Now, those investors that uh, those analysts of the financial markets that believe the hypothesis suggest that stock prices may follow a random walk. And what do they mean by that? What is a random walk? Well, let's see. Uh, in general, they have a random walk, so let's say double Z. So this is a time series. Might, or might that be an intercept? And then Z relates only to its own lag. And then an error term. Uh, to make things easy, let's forget about the intercept, sometimes called dress in the literature review. And we have a random walk that D is equal to 1. And then a the error term. So notice that if we rewrite this by subtracting the lag on both sides, we have that the change in G is utterly random from one year to the next. So the key to the random walk is whether V is equal to one. And that may be one way of testing the efficient market hypothesis. If D equals one, In this case, then the changes in the in the stock price occur at random. In other words, systematic information cannot affect the stock price. Only surprises. Well, the term, the error term, is picking up both surprises. It is that we cannot, inter we cannot anticipate, but maybe an earthquake in Omati. But by the way, I, I come from New Orleans, which in the United States is uh, known for its parties. <laughs> so sometimes, People in New Orleans think of the random walk as in terms of a, a dunk in the French footer who may either step forward or step back randomly. 
This movement of burn from the term of anticipated, dissenting from stock prices. So, uh, do you believe the efficient virtue hypothesis? Is, is it the case that even if you know a lot about the corporations that have issued stocks, you still not, are not able to profit from that information unless you're the only person with it? In other words, only if you have inside information. And there is the other side of, of the transversy critics especially those who study behavior and financial markets suggest that in fact there are patterns and prices of stocks that can be anticipated. And so the market is not efficient at processing information, information even of last week. We still be affecting stock prices today. So here's a question for you. Do you believe that the EMH is more likely to be true in Kazakhstan or in the New York Stock Exchange. Well, if investors in the New York Exchange have a lot of information and the ability to technology to react quickly to stock price changes, the hypothesis may be more likely to hold in New York rather than Kazakhstan. Why might it be the case that information affects stock prices only over time? But what might that occur? So, let's see. One possibility is that a Investors get turned away, and and they may be overestimating the increase in a stock price that is newsworthy. So, for example, I'm I'm following Cosmo and Gauss, or let's say I'm following Apple. Apple Incorporated, and I hear information that Apple is about to come out with its best version of the iPhone. So I get very excited, other people as well, and I overestimate the change in the stock price that will occur on the day of that information. So uh, to, in the next day, 
I realize that I've made a mistake. I have been too optimistic and therefore I sell off my stock. So now we have a pattern in the stock prices they rise in response to the information and then they fall because I've overestimated the change in stock prices. If that's the case, then financial markets are, are not efficient in using information. So critics of the hypothesis argue that there is positive three or four relations. So what do I mean by that? What is positive to the correlation? Like in E T in this case. Well, let's see. T now is, is the stock price. And then there's good news for Apple. So that good news is reflected in the ever term. Each here is positive. Then there is sudden good news. Now, if the image is correct, Then the next error term at time t plus one is utterly random. It does not correlate with E T because we have already at time T exploited all the available information. It does not correlate. With ET. Okay, so far. So one test of the image is whether we have correlation usually understood to be positive correlation. And two two errors, one after the other. We think that it may be positive if markets are not efficient because they have not exploited all the information about Apple or on the day of the news. Some information about Apple remains in the early term. Because investors have not acted uh, quickly On the recent news. So uh, there you have it. Uh, the, the early literature tested the hypothesis tended to conclude that there is not significant serial correlation in stock prices. Uh, but today, investors seem to be going in the other direction. So 
Ben sözü sözüm. Of this is talks. This is we may have in a certain words if we have negative serial correlation, this is possible as well. And over the act to the news about Apple. Oh, sorry. On day T, and then I try to correct my mistake by selling Apple stock on day T plus one. So the error term. is positive on day T and negative on day of T plus one. That to the evidence that the efficient market hypothesis is not correct. What about fads? How do you think that a fad might affect the destructive function? So this this thing. What did not anticipate if there is a fad? It's for a, a new computer game. So this may sound uh, familiar. Call the company a uh, more affordable miracle. I think that if Miracle's game becomes suddenly becomes popular, then investors may be at not, not directly, to the popularity of the game. But instead, to the
expectation of investors that a Fed will occur and thus raise stock prices for a long time. So notice what is happening here. Uh, these investors are not making the decision based on the actual gain, but instead they make their decisions based on what they think other investors are going to do. If they think that the gain would become a fad, they sit back and wait for other investors to spend money on the stock price. And then later on, maybe they will buy the stock. So in a case like this, it is not clear that the ever turn in the band of bulk is going to be random. We might have serial correlation. So, in summary, if you believe the hypothesis, the error term tomorrow should not correlate with the error term today. Well, but wait, this is very interesting. And this last, last election, not to buy a, a legitimate for many eight percent of the vote. <laughs> it's a remember this, this was a snap of election. So, if the case is uh, efficient, then we might expect to see. that stock prices are rising on both April 26th and April 27th. That is to say, if cases not efficient, then there should be uh, the possibility that stock prices will be rising for a while after the election. Stock prices don't respond immediately and fully. So you can take a look at whether or not the case index is, is rising a day or two after the election. And in fact, it rose about 2%. <laughs> so more of the reaction after the election, then we would have uh, concluded from the EMH. And then there are the main points.
This is just an example of serial correlation. So you have an illness over time that prevents you from studying and destroy your, your brain is going to fall over time. But your illness tomorrow depends on part of your illness today. Maybe you have the flu, and it takes several time, several days for you to recover from the flu. In that case, there is correlation in the error term for your brains because the fact that you were ill yesterday also makes it difficult for you to study tomorrow. So even though in this case, the error term is both of them are negative of business, your, your illness is reducing your brains today and tomorrow. Both of the error terms are negative. The serial correlation is positive in this case. So let's take a look at how that will work. The verity of the firm is a function of time. And there is a, the, the one that corresponds to a debole error. Okay. So here is positive correlation. One error term is positive. And then uh, the next error term is positive as well. Just one more. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, the error term begins to fall. Now, now we have made the error terms. A in an achievement from here down to here. Although these two evidences are negative, the correlation is still positive. When one error is positive, it is followed by another positive error. And when the term begins to fall, when the becomes negative, the left error term tends to be negative as well. So this is positive serial correlation. Okay, so far.
students want that puzzle to make the point clear about how serial correlation with the test of the attention market hypothesis. So talk that we are talking about students at Tina. We had data for a hundred students all in 2014. And we regressed the current GTA on the GTA for 2013. And then the ever term in this case is for student I. First thing, in this case, would you expect correlation in the error term over the index I? Then we then we draw information about 100 students. Well, let's see. In this case, we have a cross student study, not a term series, but a cross student study. So I and student I, GBEF is student I plus one. There was no reason to think that my reaction to last year's GPA is like GBEF's. So in the cross student study, there is no trivial correlation if the students are being randomly drawn. So the point is that we can have trivial correlation usually only with time series, not with cross-sectional analysis of the something that is reorganizing the cross-section cross-sectional observations so that they relate for one another. So here's an example. Let's say that I is the index for countries in Central Asia. Organized by location. So I equals one, which is the process zone, equals two, the sugar sum, equals three, to the sugar sum, because we are organizing the data so that neighbors have similar values of I. Kyrgyzstan is a neighbor of Kazakhstan, Tajikistan a neighbor of Kyrgyzstan. And now we have information about trading. Of the dependent from income to test the in nation I and so forth. And then the error term is false. 
Go fig. No. The expectation between two of the terms What do you think? Even after we control the income in Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, the top of the neighboring countries would tend to increase our trade to both countries. So if, if there is news that increases trade in Kyrgyzstan, it may also increase trade in Kyrgyzstan as well, since Kyrgyzstan trades with Kyrgyzstan. So too, even though we have a cross-section study, we may have been a correlation because the observations are organized according to proximity. So it doesn't happen, uh, but normally we expect two correlation only for term series analysis. There is a way that we can test for serial correlation if you're interested in some time in testing taste for testing TASC for the efficient market hypothesis. This is the driven Watson statistic. Uh, does this sound familiar? Maybe from the term of ethics. In this case, U is an error term. And we're taking a look at the difference between two error terms of after one time period has passed, and then we normalize it uh, with basically the, the variance of the error term. So how can this measure serial correlation? Well, let's see. Uh, to prove that we have positive serial correlation so that uh, UT is a lot like the error term on the day before. So it's these two, so these two values are very much alike. Therefore, the difference between them is very small. It's going to zero. In that case, D is going to zero as well. So we have positive correlation, zero correlation, if D is almost zero in this case. Now, 
still supposed to stand that we have negative serial correlation, but positive but negative instead. What would you expect that now to be the case to be? Is it close to zero or is it very large? Should be large. So it's good, and why? Uh, You're correct. That's because when you probably just by looking at the equation, um, you divide it, you, you square it, and divide it by u squared, you, you get a large number, you get a larger number then this but why is the numerator larger for negative correlation than for positive correlation is there is that something to do with the minus yes exactly there. Uh -huh. Just, we're yeah. looking at the difference between the errors. Yeah, because you, 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 yeah. So if, if we have negative correlation of yesterday, the error was both and positive. And then today, of the error is, or is negative instead. So there is a large spread in the error terms because they are not much alike. One small positive term is followed by one large negative term. So if you take the square of the difference, you have a very large number. And to study, B would be large as well. One last question for you. Can D be negative? I think no. Numbers. I think no. Okay, and why not? Um, because you, um, uh, there is a square, you square, mm -hmm. um, dominate and, uh, the other part. Good, yes. So, there is no way that D can ever be negative. It is either zero or positive. In fact, it has a maximum value of four, so it's negative. Serial correlation. And then there is the summary of our discussion. Now, when we talked about the efficient market hypothesis, uh, we saw that if the hypothesis is correct, we should not have serial correlation. But often we test that particular uh, claim. Here is a different question to twist it again. But the difference in the numerator and the variance with the spur of the error turn in the denominator. So let's take the probability error turn and expand it. So um, here is the square of the error term today, 
disturbed the earth uh, yesterday in a, 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 a mid middle term that consists of the single values of the earth term yesterday and today. If there is no serial correlation, this entire fraction should go to two. Why? Why is that reasonable? Well, let's take a look. Here is the numerator of the German Walton statistic. And then the middle term so it looks like this. Okay. Now, if we have no serial correlation, then the expected value of this product will go to zero. Well, the, the, in this case, that is true, but, but more generally, the expected error term of the product is the product of the expectations. Question, since u is a random term, what is the expectation? And the notional correlation. What is that expected value? Zero, of course. In fact, it's two in general. And the expected value of the error from yesterday because it is random equals zero as well. So that means that the expected value of the product This is also zero. It was zero times zero. So we expect this middle term here that we're taking expectations, it will put zero as well.
be a step this minute later. Go go to um, the expected value of t squared the time t plus the expected value of the time t minus one also squared since the middle term is zero in this case. Okay. So there is the numerator. And then this this is all divided by of the square of u at term t looks like that. So okay, um, we expect that the error term at term t as an as an expectation looks like a lot like the square of the time of the error term at time t minus one. So all three of these error terms are about a lot. That means that GW is close to two. So I will write that out if it will help you understand. So there, there is the, the first component. And then at the square of the error term, at time t minus 1, looks a lot like the square of the error term at time t. The first term here, two is equal to one. And then the second term as well is close to one. Because in general, we do not expect the error term in term t times one to differ very much from the error term at term t when they are squared. Serpent Watson is going to two in that case. So, in summary, if we have positive two of correlation, Serpent Watson is close to zero. If we have negative zero correlation, to the bottom is large. In fact, it's, it's good in the four. I will let you, show, I will let you prove that for thirty. Points of extra credit for the next week. And then finally, 
that there is no serial correlation in the first disease that turns close to two. So all we have to do to test for EMH in the present study stock exchange is to compute the error term for uh, for uh, the auto regressive equation. That is reverse the stock price at term T on the stock price at term T minus one. And then test E T with the double water statistic. If DW is close to two, what do we know? about the EMH, the efficient market hypothesis. No trivial correlation. So investors are using information very efficiently they exploit gains from the error term right away. Therefore, there is not a residual in the error term that will hold over the term T plus one. Otherwise, if the division is not close to two, we have evidence against the efficient market hypothesis. So, uh, this would be interesting to test for a case. And also, profitable because if the hypothesis is correct that markets are efficient, we know better than to try to speculate on, on stock, stock prices in case. You will find out the data for a stock index on case at the case of web address. Okay, so uh, I will stop there. Questions? Are, are you comfortable with the intuition? behind the efficient market hypothesis. The investors are exploiting all information immediately. So there is no uh, information that holds over time in the error term. The error term is always made, it's always abandoned from today to tomorrow and to the day after that. That's the idea. I had 8.30. Would you like to take a 15-minute break?
and then we will finish up for tonight. So we will meet at 8.45 if you would like to, to stretch your legs. Okay, so I will uh, stop the recording. This part of the class concerns, I think, a, a rather interesting statistical question about Kazakhstan and, and Russia. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I'm putting on the middle page a, a very lively and fascinating paper by Vyclavsky and Zodiac about a significant in implementing models. But we can make the point very simply. Usually, we talk about statistical significance. In other words, for example, does financial aid affect grades for students in general to any student at all? Would we accept that effect? Statistical significance is measuring the likelihood of that effect in general to all students. And, and yes, there does seem to be a relationship between age and grades at peanut. And the grades prevent for age are usually earn higher grades. So there is a statistical significance that the, the practical impact of aid on these is not that large, even though financial aid does matter, it does not matter very much. And there is a, a hypothetical example. Even a hundred thousand dollars in aid <laughs> will barely increase GPA, even though the T statistic is large in this case. Okay, so now here is. Uh, the puzzle that I, I think you find interesting to consider. We, we want to know whether in the past 20, 25 years, the, the Kazakhstan economy has grown more because of oil prices or because of industrialization. Which phenomenon matters more? So I, I had data here on average income in Kyrgyzstan and, and, and Russia. Oil prices and the, the average the total share of GDP. And there is the model. GDP per capita 
to Kirsten and Russia is distressed on oil prices and also on the foreign sector. So, what do you think? The oil prices and industrialization has an impact on average income. Uh, this is the data going back to uh, about 1999. Notice that the T statistic is large in both cases. So uh, a rise in the oil price of one dollar will increase GDP per capita by sixty-four dollars. And then what about this variable right here? Here is the share of the economy in Kurdistan and Russia that is claimed by farms. We have a large in magnitude T statistic and a negative coefficient. How do we interpret that negative sign? What is it telling us? Well, let's see, if farming as a share of the economy grows larger, the GDP average income will go down. Or to put it another way, if the farm sector becomes smaller, relative to the entire economy, the average income will rise. So it appears that industrialization, which reduces the front sector, is increasing GDP. A question for you, in, in this case, which predominant oil or industrial decision has the larger impact on average income? Can we answer that question? Of course, you know that they cannot answer that question with the data at hand because oil prices are measured in dollars, but the fund variable is measured in terms of percentages of GDP. We have apples and oranges. We cannot directly compare those two coefficients. So uh, let's take natural walls of all three variables, income, funding, and other prices. So that now, as you know, we have a common unit of measurement for all three variables, and therefore we can compare the impact of the two independent variables, oil prices and funding, on GDP. And this is the model. What do you conclude now? 
about whether oil has a larger impact on GDP than funding, or is it the other way around? Well, uh, my own expectation was that for Russia and Kazakhstan, oil prices should matter more for, in, for GDP than industrialization. But look at the politicians. What do you conclude? A one percent rise in industrialization the lower average GDP but more than one half of a percent. And then what about oil? A rise in oil prices does increase average income but, but less than one fourth of one percent. So the interesting thing is that historically it was the oil that drove the three countries of Kazakhstan and Russia, not oil, it was industrialization. A rather surprising result. And that's it. With just one more question for you. Look at the David Boston statistic in this case. 1.4. So, what do you think? Are they likely to have legal correlation or positive or negative? Uh, it has no correlation. Uh, just do remember that if the statistic is close to two, we have no correlation. And if it is close to zero, we have positive correlation. That's good. Uh, in this case, it, it's hard to avoid a, a, a fast confusion because 1.4 is rather intermediate between zero and two. A bit closer to two, but um, there may be some ambiguity. So, uh, the next time, we'll take a look at how to uh, resolve a question like that about the two-digit statistic. Otherwise, go ahead and read, and read chapter 6 in the textbook on writing up to results. And that's the whole nine yards for tonight. Questions? Okay, good. Enjoy your weekend and I'll see you later on. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.